This is the Sales Spin Podcast. 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 You are listening to Sales Spin, India's top B2B sales podcast, where we bring the world's best sales experts, successful sellers, and sales leaders who share their strategies to succeed in sales right now and talk about things no one else will. And now, Raul Wadwa. Your background so that people who are listening to this or probably watching this can actually relate to you. Yeah, I spent 15 years in enterprise software covering strategic accounts for other kind of SaaS enterprise software companies and was selling kind of up market. Mm -hmm. Really wanted to follow more of my passion, which was which was more kind of building my own business, of course, and then also really around modern kind of outbound lead generation mm -hmm. data using tools using technology to make things better faster quicker awesome you know you talk about the email delivery a lot i'm curious to understand and this is the, something which i'm now seeing on my linkedin a lot because now most of the leaders are talking about it i'm curious and i'm probably coming from a place where you know I, I mentor a lot of new sdrs and they might not even be aware of this problem and might be getting fired might be getting on PIPs every single day and because their leader is probably telling them, hey, it's your email delivery. It's actually your email writing skills, which is at stake, but that might not be the case. Yeah, I mean, this is a great, great question here. What, what really is happening right now is since delivery is such a black box in a lot of ways, right? Mm -hmm. When you when you send an email to somebody else where you're email gets placed in their inbox is really a mystery, right? You, there's tactics you can use to figure out where it's going to place based on other heuristics. But what's happening is there's a lot of people that, you know, with COVID, of course, there was a huge sh shift in uh, email protection software threat. And remember, email is still the number one attack surface for hackers. So this is why you have to go through all those weird trainings with your company and all of that. But what's happening is all of these training or all of these emails are starting to get more into the spam folder because they're just all you have to do is tip that number, that score up to a certain threshold. Depending on the organization, they're going to be a little bit more picky. Obviously, the bigger, bigger, more companies that have more to lose are going to be mm -hmm. definitely a lot harder to get through. Right. right. So. You don't really know if it goes through. You can only really guess based on other heuristics, based on the fact that you've set things up right, based on the fact that you've collected data. And what we're finding is it's going down a lot, but there's a lot of people who have really haven't realized that the open rates have actually changed quite a bit because of Apple. Apple's opening mm -hmm. a lot of your emails now. So your open rate should have gone up, but in the case of most people, it's gone down which means it's really gone down. So people don't really understand the thresholds that have happened. I've been tracking this since the beginning and you know I have some really good data on this. Now, how did you first discover that you know this is actually the problem? Because like I said, a lot of STRs were probably new. If they're not watching this or they're not following you, they might not even be aware of this. I was not aware of this about this whole concept until you know I spoke to you like six months ago. Yep. So I'm guessing someone like me who's been into the space for five years did not know. I'm guessing that's the case with everybody. Yeah. So the good thing about email, and this is one of the things that sets it apart, is it's not a social media website or anything. And the way that mm -hmm. I figured it out was I was a rep and I was trying, I was failing, right? And I saw ways to optimize. Now I worked for some companies and they were, they would take the feedback, they'd get me with it mm -hmm. and then I would fix the problem for it. Right. And then there were other companies I went to where, you know, I wanted to talk to, I guess the last and final time I wanted to talk to the it department, the engineering department to get mm -hmm. it fixed. And they put me on with HR and fired me. So, you know, that was a little bit of an uncomfortable position, but it, it also created the fact that now I can, you know, have resilience and not worry about that and just show people the data and show people and hopefully they respect it, right? I run my own business. I don't have to worry about that anymore. So you talked about this problem, okay, which has been existing for a while, especially since the time you said, you know, pandemic hit. So you kind of realized this. I'm guessing few other leaders who probably know you because now I'm seeing this on LinkedIn a lot for the last four, three, four, five months. So I'm guessing leaders are now getting this problem and at least pay, they're paying attention. What I'm trying to understand is if I'm setting up my SDR function for the first time, all right. Help me out. What what all I can do to make sure I'm not landing in spam? Yep. Yeah. So let's talk about like a normal kind of 
organization and then we can talk about the extremes after sure. but let's talk about like your your typical SaaS or sales development team using possibly like an outreach or sales loft or one of the popular you know outplay one of the popular uh, scp tools so what those teams are basically what really needs to happen is you need to understand the concept of something called mail flow right and the reputation is through the domain name so by knowing that you basically have to keep an eye on how many bounces you've had, right? The number should be, you shouldn't really be over 2% bounces, right? It's easy mm -hmm. to validate emails, right? You don't, you shouldn't be sending the emails that bounce. Mm -hmm. You know, you, that's one area. I mean, there's another couple of areas like complaints. Your IT department knows if a company reports you as a complaint. Do they share that with you all the time? Probably not, right? Unless it gets bad and you get put in kind of G Suite jail or whatever they call it. Mm -hmm. But What's happening is you've got these groups of people that have kind of an unlimited, ungoverned engagement platform and cold email to by default is already at a three to 5% response rate on an even, even a good campaign. Now the mail flow systems really want you to be way above that. So it doesn't look good that your domain is getting that. And then what happens is it tips the scale the wrong way and now most of your emails are now inside a spam filter and the response rates are dramatically like it's just they don't people don't respond if it's in your spam folder really right unless you tell them or they find out from somebody else that it wasn't there so even if they wanted to respond they couldn't that's one problem and really what i think is going to happen is you're going to start to realize that the emphasis on messaging is going to shift to more delivery and part of the problem is delivery is a hard thing for a sales team and a sales ops team to cover. You really need more of a market team to help out here because it gets to become more of a systems. And, and a lot of these companies aren't really designed to scale the same way. So it's a, it's a, it's a weird thing that's happening that like kind of nobody wants to talk about right now because hmm. they know like, it's happening. They probably think I'm right, but they don't really know a good way to fix it. So that's kind yeah, of what's sure. going on right now. I'm guessing, you know, most of them are actually in the same boat. So you talked about your email can never get open or never get reply because they actually never landed in the primary inbox and they'll yep. they spam. So my next question would be, you know, how to avoid it. Yeah, sure. So there's, there's, there's some things that would help you avoid it. So the number one thing right now, I think if you're going to do anything, put, put limits in place on your your sales mm -hmm. development team, right? Don't, don't let them send over. I mean, we're sending 50. I mean, don't let them send over 75 a day on the, on an inbox. I wouldn't go, I wouldn't even go that high, but like, mm -hmm. you know, it depends on what you're comfortable with, but you know, just stop that part of it. Cause most of those emails are going to be copy and pasted, right? They're going to be the same email over and over with a couple of different fields merged. Correct. The other thing you want to do is you want to run two checks. One check you want to run is a, the checks call, it's like a mail, you can run like a, you know, like an MX toolbox diagnostic, which tells you which delivery settings you have off. I have it on my LinkedIn profile of like, if you mm -hmm. want to try to figure that out, that's kind of checking your own servers. And you're going to probably find you could be in a series C or D company and you still have these problems. So like, don't, don't think that you're, you know, I've even found publicly traded companies that did not have their record set up right. And they deteriorate over time because you add more records to the DNS. This is like the mapping of all of the services in your company so other companies could access it. What happens is those deteriorate as your company adds more services in your company. And then sometimes they screw up the cold email settings. Mm -hmm. So you have to check that. The other thing you want to do is do something called a seed test. Now, this is where a lot of companies aren't doing. What you do is you got to go use a service that has a seed test. There's a bunch of them out there. Just Google it like Clock Apps has it. And this is where you test an email to like an email that you would send, you would test it to see if it lands where it lands, like in the primary inbox or wherever. Now, the nice thing about seed testing is, is they have inbox up at all the major providers. So if you regularly do this test, you can start to see if there's a trend like, hey, we're not getting in on Outlook anymore. What's going on? Then you might know your domains burned. And that's where you start to run into a problem. Because remember, the two major providers are Google and Outlook. So if you get burned on one of the one of the two, you could be in a real world of hurt. And sometimes it takes two to three weeks to repair a domain once it's burned. And that's really the reality. So seed testing, checking the delivery optimization settings, and then really like data validation and making sure that you're using validated emails is really the next one. 
All righty. I think that, that brings me to like tons of other questions. So you talked yep. about something like MX testing. So yep. can you maybe elaborate on that? So I have a new domain. I'm a new company, like, so let's say, yep. uh, seed or series A. So my domain is not that old. Uh, mm -hmm. and I think we would, uh, I would love for you to talk more about the different domains, but before that, where do I go to make sure I can test how old is my domain? What's my domain rep reputation right now? Sure. So really you have to start doing more, you have to start sending emails and you have to start looking at like your open rate. That's one of the good ways to kind of figure out what your rep reputation is. There's also a thing in Google where you can check the postmaster. You have to set that up first. A lot of people don't have that set up. It'll tell you kind of your reputation in there, depending on which service you're using. But what I would do is a, as a brand new domain, this is what we do. It takes about three weeks to get it up and running right. So what we do first is we register the domain. We make sure that it's like a top level domain. This is another thing. People are trying to register these kind of way off domains. Just register something like what you have now, get a .com, get a .net, get a .io, you know, or like, a you know, if you're in a major you know, country, like get the hmm. local country domain or whatever, wherever you're emailing. And what you want to do is start something called an email warm up on that. There, there are a lot of tools. I'll try to, I hate to recommend tools because right. if something changes like next week, there could be an app, you know. <laughs> So I, I will, I'll refrain from doing that, but there's a lot of tools out there that do email warm up. And what you want to do is start that out at a really low number, like a three, right? That's three emails per day. And what it does is it starts emailing around the network. Mm -hmm. So there's a bunch of other people who have opted into this warm up network, typically mm -hmm. people who send a lot of cold emails. And you want to start using that domain for three weeks with all of the right settings on. The right settings are the ones that the, the provider tells you to set up. And if you run those that camp that for three weeks and you get it up to 40 emails and you're running it and there's no none of those emails are going into spam, then you're in business. Now you can stop that warm up feature and you can start sending. The problem with warm up, though, is it's a bit of a gray hat move. Right. So there's a lot of people who are like, well, you're kind of artificially. But this is what all email marketing people do anyways. Right. Like, so mm -hmm. that's why it's starting to become more of an email marketing function. And people that understand e-commerce and that are getting kind of into the space as well. So hopefully that kind of sums it up. It's three week warm up and make sure the delivery settings are right. Okay, awesome. So we got our email set up. We got our email warm up set up. What's the next step? Next step would really be to make sure that the data that you have is validated. So we've been testing a lot of the tools out there, the major ones, and, and most of them have at least a 40 to 60% bounce rate. And it's funny because a lot of them even own, won't go into the, I'm not going to name names, but some of them even own bounce validation companies, which makes <laughs> it even more interesting. So it just shows you when you're structuring your contracts with your data providers, you want to keep an eye on this because there's a process called validation. Now I want to kind of dig into that because what a lot of people think it is, it's like, yeah, we know they're high quality or whatever, but it, validation is not like quality of the, it's a binary decision, right? So when you get a list from, let's say, any of the major providers, they're going to give you an email and they're going to say, this is that person's business email. What you need to do then is you need to run something called an email validation and you need to put this step inside your process, meaning you can't send emails that aren't validated. You'll really do damage. But what you do is you test it and then there's going to be some responses that come back. Now, the responses are critical. So one response is valid. Go right ahead. Start sending emails. In fact, if you send emails to all the valid emails, you're going to have a good day, right? Mm -hmm. It's going to be a lot better. You're going to get that delivery. Everything's good. Start there. Now, what happens is some of the emails aren't going to come back valid. They're going to come back as something called a catch-all. Now, what a catch-all does, it's something set up from the IT department, which they basically say, we're not going to tell you if that email is here or not. And there's a lot of companies that won't give you that information. So you have to make a decision on that catch-all and you have to think about where it came from, how you got it, and if you can find it on other kind of public sites. It, uh, there's like another kind of, what I do is I cohort those and find out, all right, which one of these catch-alls can I find on other websites? If I can't find it, I'm gonna make sure that if I'm sending to these people, I'm sending it on a completely separate domain name and I'm not doing anything. I'm not sending all those through my main primary domain name because if you start to send through that and you start hitting all these catch-alls, you're in trouble. And then I guess there's also bouncing, which you never want to send a bounce. Like 
it's just completely unacceptable to send anything to bounced emails and you're just not checking it. And then there's another one that's a spam trap and that one's even worse because that one's the one they set up and then they report you as spam immediately. I think one so, of the things you, you and I talked about, I'm just sorry, go ahead. Yeah, no, I was just, that's what you have to look up. I think one, one of the things you and I talked about some um, time back was, uh, for example, if I have 100 prospects, I would first want to run this via these bound checkers, you know, where they tell me which one is valid, which one is a catch all and which one is bound. So your recommendation is not to send any emails to bounce or maybe basically verify again with another provider if you can get a valid one and maybe recheck on, on, until you reach like a valid or catch all. Yeah. So the ones that are that come back bounce, just don't email those. Right. You could double check it with another provider, but some of the providers out there, what they do is they it benefits them to not check it as mm -hmm. long because that's how they pay their compute costs for cloud. But there's some providers that will give you a 30 to 40 second check. You basically need to wait is that's the secret. You need to wait to get the answer back from those. Mm -hmm. So go for don't go for speed, go for accuracy, of course. Mm -hmm. And when you but if it's still coming back bounce after 30 seconds of waiting, then you base and this the tools will do it automatically. This isn't a manual process by any means. And what you want to do is send to those ones that they, the validation tools will tell you to send to. And I also would not validate with the provider that you buy the data from. Do it from another provider just so you know you're getting that kind of consistency there. Got it. Another thing which I remember, you know, we, we talked about was not only to send these catch-all emails from another domain, but also run a different sequence. That way, as you know, you can always validate whether it's impacting your original sequence or not. Because if you're sending it to all valid, your your open rates could be even more higher. I mean, that's what I, I at least realize. Yeah. We try to get about a 70, 75% open rate across 10,000 emails, right? Like that's our goal because what we realize is the compounding impact of mm -hmm. getting it earlier. It's just like a four, you know, it's just like investing earlier. It's just big. And what you're, what you're mentioning there is, is in terms of changing the sequence around. So there is a, a really, one of the other things that the spam filters will check is if you're sending to some of the same domains, mm -hmm. if you send that same email without any, any, any of the text changed, that gets picked up pretty quickly. So what you can do is you can add these kind of like variables in it. You know, there's something called spin tax. I mean, you know, look it up, but a lot of these tools have multiple variables. So you'd say like, hey, you know, whatever, hello, whatever, right? You, you can kind of change the variables and, and make, the, make the sequences different every time they go out. A lot of the tools, most, I think pretty much every tool has that functionality. It's just a lot of people don't really take the time to do that. And you really need to now, you really need to go in and, and make these, things unique, right? And you want to add stuff that's unique to each person, if you could, right? Like there's ways to do that too, on a spreadsheet to mail merge it the right way. And, you know, there's a lot of strategies on this and the people that figure this stuff out are going to be the ones that are successful with gold email. Awesome. So in one of your posts, you also talked about uh, some validation using Excel. Could you maybe talk a little bit more about uh, that? Yeah. So there's a so in Google Sheets, there's a there's a feature, and I kind of exposed this on uh, LinkedIn. I kind of gave away one of the secrets here. Hopefully, it doesn't get, you know, blocked or somebody. But one of the ways you can get some of those catch-alls back and get a little bit more confidence level on them. Obviously, it's not a hundred percent, but you can you can right-click on Google Sheets when you put an email in, and it's very similar. Like if you type in somebody's name in a in an email, but you can right-click and go convert to people chip. And then what you do is you see you see the name turn gray if it's a real email or not on Google. Now there is a little bit of a margin of error we found, but I just talked to somebody who he just I messaged me in my DMs over the weekend and he said he just enriched 14 million emails for free, so he was pretty happy. He just saved himself like I don't know that might have been like fifteen twenty thousand dollars of data right that he just figured out. He might even have a bigger database than some of these providers, but. That gives you that confidence back. So if it's a catch-all and you find it there, it'll only find people on G Suite though. So oh, it's that's yeah. a catch. Yeah, there's a so if you do it, it basically looks to see if they're on Google and if they have mm -hmm. an email on Google. It's one of the ways to do it, right? Like that's one of the ways to get some of your catch-alls back. I exposed this on there, and that that post got like two hundred thousand views, of course, because it was a pretty good secret. And I was surprised because usually quality posts don't really make it past the algorithm. 
you know, yeah, like, I mean, believe it or not, so when you first told me, I was doing this one by one until I realized that I could actually select the entire car <laughs> and, you know, just do it in one go. <laughs> so, but It yeah. also gives you other information like cell phones sometimes. Like there's a lot of information in there you get. So it's definitely something you want to look at, look at on Google Sheets. Okay. Help me with the next step. So let's say I, I find, let's say, hundreds of catch-all. I put that in Google Sheet. You're saying that it's going to only identify the Google email addresses. It's going to turn it into gray. Yep. What's your next recommendation? Should we put this again from a different domain into a different sequence or how do you do that? I would, so the, the best strategy would be to take that and put it on one. Those emails are lower quality, of course, because they're not mm -hmm. valid. You haven't validated them. Right. There's no way to make them valid because they're catch-alls. But I would say there's a pretty high confidence level that you'd want to email them. And I would probably try to isolate that to, to one group of domain names. Obviously, like the hard part is, is the reputation level is driven by the domain name, right? This is what people, it's domain name and IP address. Now, let's think through this a little bit, right? Nobody is blocking Google, Zoho, and Microsoft's IP pool, right? So it has nothing to do with the IP for those providers. Maybe for like DigitalOcean or somebody like that, it's going to be a little bit, you know, they're, they're not as, they're kind of known. They have a lot of people on there that are sending a lot of emails. But for those three providers, the, the world has said, we don't care. We know that we can't reject emails from Microsoft, Zoho, and Google. So your best tactic would be to blend in, right? So the domain name is what the reputation is based on. Right. So you think Microsoft and Google have a little bit of a war going on right now. I can tell they're starting to get a little more aggressive on putting each other's domains in spam. <laughs> but let's not talk about that. What we have seen is if you can kind of stay on one of those shared platforms, you keep your limits low, you blend in, you send relevant emails with relevant information to relevant people. You're complying with all of the laws and everything in your country. You know, obviously there's GDPR and you want to be mindful of that. But if you do this, you are going to get a good return on your cold email program. This is going to change the way that you kind of get business. And remember, cold email, you don't have to physically be there. This is one of the things that I think I argue a little bit with the cold. There's a there's a special group of people and I have a I really like these people. They're really I respect them quite a bit, but they always fight with you. They'll tell you you're like a wimp, get on the phones. Like there's this kind of like macho, <laughs> I don't know, thing going on. But I don't really understand it because you physically have to be there to make cold calls, right? If I don't physically have to be there to send cold emails, I'll take that because I can spend time with my family and I don't have to go, you know, send, you know, they send while I'm sleeping, right? Like I don't need to be there. And that's a huge advantage to cold emails. True. I mean, one of the question I had, uh, which something you know, I, I get, especially from the early stage founders all the time, even yep. let's say SDRs who are getting into a different territory or different industry altogether, where they have no experience in terms of what should be my benchmark look like. And sure. I, I often don't have the answer because if I were them, I would probably look at uh, some sort of stats, some sort of studies. Uh, I mean, if you think about this, most of the SaaS studies or most of the email open rates are, you know, sort of genetic. So what do you think for example we're running a lot of campaigns and we we mm -hmm. are seeing the stats and we see what a good campaign looks like and we see what a bad one looks like right so let's just talk through it so in terms of the stats you want to watch open rate and you're going to see a lot of the gurus out there are going to tell you it's a, it's a vanity metric don't just ignore it unfortunately it really isn't it really isn't right now and and they'll tell you well it's not a vanity metric it gives you a performance of your email delivery and subject line and the timing of that email. So what we like to see for an open rate is for like a big sales organization, sales development team, like a 40% or, or better. Right? If you're below 40, you know, and I just did a John Barrows webinar on this and the average was like 10 or 15. And I was, you know, shaking my head a little bit because I was like, whoa, this is not good because you're not going to get the level of that. So first thing is open rate. Second thing I would look at is response rate. Now, we tend to get around five, but in kind of earlier in the campaign, we'll get about three. This would be the number of people that have opened the email that we can get to respond. Now, I'm talking about all the response levels, right? Mm -hmm. Negative, positive, doesn't matter, right? Now, I know people are like, well, why do you? No, no. So you've got to look at the total number 
of responses. And then what we do is we back that number into something we call a positive response rate. These are like, yes, I'd like to learn more. I'll take a meeting, mm -hmm. right? They're like one step away from that meeting or they're actually asking for the meeting, right? Or whatever the high ticket item is, right? That you're trying mm -hmm. to sell, right? So we do 50 or sorry, 40% open rate, 3% response rate. So a lot of teams are at one or two get that doesn't work, right? You're gonna have to figure that out. And then the positive response rate, we like to see a 15% rate. So that's of those 3% that kind of come back through. Mm -hmm. That's you want to see 15% of those become positive. So I can give you kind of an example. Let's say you sent out 3,750 emails that got opened. Mm -hmm. Sorry, you sent out 7,500 emails that got opened. And then your next number would be you got 113 that were responded to. Mm -hmm. That might be 16 positive responses. And then you're booking maybe out of those, you're booking about 80% of those meetings, right? Because if they positively responded, you should be able to get the meeting. Got it. So that right there is about 13, 14 meetings, right? So that, that's kind of how you have to do it. So just to recap, open rate, 40%. Response rate, 3%. Positive response rate, 50, 15%, sorry. The numbers get a little bit confusing here, but you know, 43, 15, and then the show rate of the people that actually show up to the meeting, 80%. Those are the numbers you have impact over. Got it. And, you know, there's one other number, but it doesn't kind of fit into the equation, but you should be checking for under a 2% bounce rate. You should not have over a 2% bounce rate. That can severely impact your campaign as well, but it doesn't fit into the same funnel. Got it. So I'm guessing uh, when you talk about these numbers, 3,750 emails or whatever the number you talked about, mm -hmm. is this specific to a particular industry or is this like common across? So it's it's after sending a lot. I, uh, the two industries that I've targeted or, or have done it mm -hmm. with is either agency, like service-based agencies, like digital marketing or, or whatever, mm -hmm. and, and more like technology, SaaS, and maybe a little bit of IT services. So I've tried all three and I... I haven't seen a huge difference between the three industries. I think it could only get better if you're doing it to an industry that th those are probably the harder industries to target mm -hmm. because they've actually got a, more people kind of targeting them. Obviously, that's where a lot of the world's going. So I think you could probably expect higher ones. I've talked to some people who are in regulatory industries that are doing cold email and they're killing it right now where they've shared a couple of their numbers and they're, they're in some like more compliant, like where there's not a lot of people selling. Mm -hmm. and they're getting their cold emails off the ground and they're they're really doing well so i think there's opportunity there to get even more but i think that's a pretty good benchmark for you know really everybody who would be watching this podcast i have one final question yeah so some of some of the founders some of the sdrs might say hey i only sell to ceos i only sell to one persona right so uh, that could be the reason why my open rate is low do you think that's a case or really no and i'll tell you why because uh, you know and i did some consulting right for for winning by design, top management mm -hmm. consulting firm in the world, really for SaaS, right? And you know the real strategy that you really, you know, after looking at benchmarking in 500 companies, like you really got to go into the company where the biggest emotional impact is, right? Like this is somebody who's blocked or whatever. You got to find your mobilizer. So if people are targeting the CEO, you know what's the <laughs> The only thing I could see you'd be targeting the CEO for would be possibly, you know, funding, right? Or maybe, you know, maybe, maybe his email's not working or their email's not working. Sorry there. But, um, you know, I think that's the thing is like you really, when you're going into any company for any, it doesn't matter what outreach method you're using. Mm -hmm. right? CEOs are going to be much lower response, as you'd imagine, mm -hmm. right? But they're not going to be lower response if you get the right like you get the right pain. The problem is their pain points aren't the same as like, you know, if you're an SDR manager, you need more meetings on the calendar. You need tools to help you do that. You know, you know, you could go after that group, right? The emotional impact isn't as big, but for a CEO, it might be more fundraising. It might be more, you know, visibility into the market, data insights. You'd probably still get a pretty good, you probably still get your 3% response rate if you were relevant, but you got to go for that person who can mobilize internally and become your champion. Mm -hmm. I think you covered everything pretty much in less than 30 minutes. Any final thoughts? No, I mean, you know, just take a look at this, right? Like you don't have to change it all tomorrow. What you do have to do though, is you have to start thinking like what damage 
am I doing with my cold email program? Is it worth mm -hmm. it? Right. You're spending, you know, companies are spending a ton of money on these programs, put it on another domain name. Right. And, you know, do it that way and do something to just make sure that you're getting a reasonable open rate. Mm -hmm. Like, don't just sit there and wait for it to get better. It's not going to get better. It's going to get worse, way worse because the spam filters are picking it up. And the last thing I'll end with is another tactic that a lot of people have been thinking. They get with their IT department and then their IT department immediately tries to put them on what they call an email service provider, like more of like an enterprise grade sending system like a, like a Amazon SES, SendGrid, mm -hmm. Mailgun, all those. I'm going to tell you right now, you do not want to do this. And I can talk to you about why, but the real reason why is you can torch the domain in less than a day and you'll, you won't be able to send from it for months. So be very careful about that. You don't want to put your team on a dedicated IP. You don't want to put them on a dedicated sending platform that, by the way, doesn't allow cold email. You want to be on a shared provider. So I think I'll end with that. If you have any questions, you feel free to reach out. I'm always available there. And then, you know, looking forward to everybody's feedback. Wow. This was super insightful, Jesse. Thank you so much, man. Yeah, thanks. Have a good one. You too. This is the Sales Spin Podcast. 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 You are listening to Sales Spin, India's top B2B sales podcast, where we bring the world's best sales experts, successful sellers, and sales leaders who share their strategies to succeed in sales right now and talk about things no one else will.